is going to be on instant restenosis, and we're going to have George Adams and his team show us a, a nice case from North Carolina. And just to give all of you perspective, you know, just think to yourselves that there's really only four randomized trials for DCB with, in terms of ISR. There's one for laser and there's one for the covered stent or the Viabon. And so the rest are all non-RCP trials in terms of all the different therapies for ISR. So, George, can you hear us uh, out there? This is yeah, tomorrow. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly and perfect. we see you. Yep, yep. Do you want to introduce Welcome from Raleigh, stories? North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, welcome to you. <laughs> all right, it's a pleasure to be here. Interventional cardiologist, George Adams. I've got a great team working with me today. I've got Tina, Veronica, Ivy, Anna to my left, and Jill out on the... Um, I guess you would say saxophone on the, on the computer, but regardless, so we've got a great case. So this is a 57 year old female who I've known over the years, um, has a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, has had prior stents placed in the left superficial femoral artery. Um, she represented recently with claudication. Her last intervention was 2019. Um, so she's gone about two to two and a half years since uh, the last time I saw her or last time we intervened on her. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and show you the angiogram. What we've done, we've got a 645 sheet up and over. Her ABI was 0.6 on the left side. I think you can appreciate um, the left common femoral is widely patent. The deep femoral profunda is widely patent. And uh, she has a, a nub of the SFA. Um, and it's in stent restenosis. And these stents extend all the way down to the distal SFA. Um, uh, this is the second shot, uh, again, the deep femoral. And then as we get down to uh, the P1 segment of the popliteal, you can see the popliteal reconstitute um, to the end of the stented segment. Um, and what's really nice is that she's got three vessel runoff. And I've taken it all the way to the foot. Um, and I think this is very important. Most operators should do this. So then you know what you've got at the end of the day and you take those final shots. So again, three vessel runoff, we've got an SFA in step race stenosis. There was some, um, and then let me just show you this. So what we've done is we've crossed this SFA. Um, it was not that hard, actually. Used a Mongo wire and we used a Navicross. Um, and then what I did was, considering that, is uh, we switched out for a beer wire um, and then placed a large nav six filter at the level of the popliteal artery. Okay. Um, so, to, to begin, there's been some discussion in regards to prepping the vessel, a uh, leave nothing behind strategy. Um, so, we've chosen, considering this is a uh, soft slash instant restenotic plaque, to use laser aspectomy. And I know um, Brian uh, Dare Burn has talked a little bit about it, and I know you've had some, uh, a couple lectures on this. Um, to show that, I'm going to show you, we also, before, uh, after we did this, we went down with an IVUS. So can you show the IVUS image? Go ahead and play it for him. Um, hold on one second, and we'll play it. Great. And so this is distal to the stents coming back. You can see the stents here. Um, and then we get into this soft re plaque, okay? And then what's interesting is as we pull back, there are some areas of reconstitution, right? Um, so, and we commonly see this in some of these, like right here, you see in the 12 o'clock view, you see some areas that you can't really appreciate angiographically, but there are collaterals still in it. And um, uh, so there are some areas where there are, there is patency. Okay, that's good. All right, so now just to show a demonstration really quickly, we've chosen the power laser, okay? Um, see if I can get it here. Um, the, the thing about this power laser, it has a deflecting tip, okay? And I can show that here, right? You can see it sort of rotating, so you get a bigger lumen. Um, the other thing that's nice about this laser is that it's eccentrically mounted. So you don't have dead space. You know, the, the original Exmer layers were concentric on the wire, okay? The other thing is, and sh let's show them down here. I'm going to do a little demonstration here. Um, this is a uh, heparinized failing, uh, and then what, what happens is, can you go ahead and push, uh, it's ready, perfect. Let me show you what happens in normal saline. I think everybody can appreciate, 
that's uh, pretty non-volatile. In contrast, if you use the laser, okay, this is what happens. And I think everybody can appreciate, you saw Ivy jump trying to show that to you. That's the reason that when we flush the, uh, the laser, um, we use normal saline rather than contrast. There are sometimes you may want to use contrast in hard calcific plaque, but again, that's off-label, but regardless. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go down over this 014 barrel wire with this um, uh, laser atherectomy, the power laser, and then just try to prep the vessel in regards to um, trying to have a leave nothing behind strategy so we don't have to lay more stent. Hopefully use a drug coat of balloon post um, to get a good result. Any comments from the panel? Would hey, anybody do anything different? Hey, hey, George, we have a great uh, group of panelists here today. We've got Nick Shamas. We've got uh, Aaron Armstrong. Uh, we've got great. Dr. Car Caraccio and Christian Bianchi and, and Dr. Kuldeep Singh uh, who are here. So maybe we can go down the panel and ask them, you know, this case. Uh, and, I, and I missed the initial history. You said Claudicant or CLI? It's a Claudicant. Claudicant. In this case scenario, if maybe we could start uh, here with Alfio, and uh, how would you guys treat this case? Is this your first choice laser for ISR? Which has the filter on there, sir. Do you consider covered stent, DCB, et cetera? What's your, your, what's your algorithm? Good question. Maybe I missed it. How long has it been since the previous treatment? Two and a half years. Two, George, two and a half how long years. since the previous treatment? Two and a half years. And was drug used the initial treatment or no? Drug eluding stents were placed. I would probably just proceed with DCB and see what's left behind. Cool, deep. You know, uh, I've got to start use the uh, Rotorex uh, device and uh, actually had a very, very nice result. Uh, even without ballooning, I uh, took a picture, of course, we bloomed it after. Okay, here uh, we go. But I, I just want to be a little uh, controversial. Before I had access to the world of I use now laser, I use it as well, is uh, I used to use uh, a Silverhawk, a directional and directional device, uh, always put a filter. That got me a nice lumen. Uh, but of course, there's always that risk of embolization with that soft plaque. I just want to know what, what uh, others uh, think about that. What are the other? Th what do the others think about this case here? And, and, and how does IVIS direct you here? Obviously, it's, it was soft. It was easy to cross. Uh, the IVIS did not show a lot of thrombus. At least I didn't see any. It looks like it's just the typical, you know, fibra. You know, that intimal kind of spongy tissue that you see with ISR. Did the IVIS change your management here when you looked at this? Dr. Shamas? So this, this is a classic case of ISR, you know, where you have the mixed, probably thrombotic as well as resinotic tissue. You can see from the IFS very clearly multiple pockets of translucency. I mean, this is really probably thrombus sitting in addition to all that resinotic tissue. So the choice of the laser is excellent, as you know, works very well on thrombus. Uh, but also, you know, the jet stream is another device that we use very frequently in these situations. It has the um, ability to aspirate at the same time. Uh, now we have the Orion laser too, the aspiration capability. That's a, a big plus, you know, uh, irrespective, you know, uh, you've got to have a filter, you know, in place. You know, again, the choice of the NAF6 filter is excellent. Uh, you know, the wire and the filter are not uh, stuck to each other. So the motion of that wire will not affect the filter motion. I like that particularly. Uh, and, and it works very well being validated and works very well in peripheral applications. So uh, um, I, I think the laser choice is excellent, um, you know, for... Final treatment, DCB has to be the one. Uh, I can't see how you can, not, can get away without a drug-coated balloon at the end. Uh, the restenosis rate with every single atherectomy device has been quite high in instant restenosis e without any maintenance with drug-coated. So I will probably do exactly what George is doing, uh, take care of that with the laser, use the embolic filter, then couple that with a uh, you know, uh, DCB at the end. Christian, let me ask you this. In this case, would you use a Viabon? Would you use a covered stent here? You've got a three-vessel runoff. It is a claudicant. You've got ISR. It has an RCT, although it's been a while. What Would you use a, a covered stent? And if not, why not? 
yeah, I think for, for most of us, stepping back a little bit on the indication, there's a fail in the vascular intervention, two years and a half, stenting was placed at the time, and a symptomatic recurrence. Um, I will give it a try in medical therapy uh, before. Probably George didn't mention that, but I'm sure he did it. And then stratify whether it's a bypass versus an endovascular reintervention, or, or maybe there's no other interventions uh, with, as we see in critical limbs. So specifically addressing the indication, I think is symptomatic but claudicant, prior endovascular intervention that failed, instant restenosis is the mode, approach to that, I will agree with the panel. I don't think I have anything to add. I think other options, including Viabon, uh, to, I guess, squeeze when we didn't have um, as much data as RCTs for instant restenosis, there's always this worry on thrombotic um, dislodgement in the three-vessel runoff and compromise in the runoff. Um, so I, I think this is probably a very good option, protecting the runoff. Dr. Jenkins? Well, I think IBIS is key, as Dr. Shamaya said. Um, as you could tell, we couldn't really see angiographic images very well. But the second step is always going to be a drug-coated balloon, unless you bet you initially you want to balloon and uh, I think a lot of people would balloon and use covered stents for this uh, just for simplicity but if you're going to debulk this or not I think it's dependent on both your IVUS which we saw well uh, we probably should uh, and your angiographic imaging but if I have a two-year-old instant restenosis with minimal tissue I'm not going to go straight to a, a, a debulking device I'm going to probably just put a drug-coated balloon, keep it simple, stupid, uh, if it's something I can take care of with that. Because two and a half years is a pretty good time. But but we don't know it failed immediately, right? He may have had a patency and then eventually He's asymptomatic, so who knows? Um, he's symptomatic. Yeah. Oh, he is. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's he symptomatic, I thought yeah. he was yeah. symptomatic. Okay. So I don't know the primary symptom. Well, then we could tell clinically uh, when he reached uh, We can ask George, yeah. George, you want to tell us what you're doing or how many pa Can you tell us? Uh, yeah. So, you, were you using the Phillips so, laser or the angiodynamics laser? The, the Phillips laser. It was the power okay. laser with a deflecting tip. Yeah. Okay. Remember, we did a study um, to try to give us some sort of idea on um, what laser settings to use. Um, hold on one second. There we go. Okay. Can we get IBIS again, please? I think that's the key, key here that will help all of us is, you know, does IVIS help you determine what laser settings you use, your fluency, et cetera? Can you explain what your algorithm is for that? Because that's a, that's a key component of using this laser. Exactly. And remember, I published a paper about a year ago, and we actually looked at different plant morphologies to see if we could personalize cadium. So in terms of personalizing care, with a restenotic plaque like this, I would go 40-60, 60-40, uh, and then 60-60, okay? Um, so what we've done now is we've done that with the laser. Um, the deflecting tip allows us to get a little bit more area. And so now I've got an IVIS in, and let's see what we've done, okay? So, so George, just, uh, just to clarify, you did three passes uh, uh, forward only, not pulling back, correct? Forward only. Yes, sir. I did not um, uh, use the laser pulling back. There's no harm in doing that, but I don't know how much gain you get by pulling back doing it. Correct. correct. And the other thing that's important when you use laser ethectomy is to go slow. Let the device work. Yeah, and I think the okay. key here is to realize right. that there is always some thrombotic component in, in, in these ISR cases, and so protecting your distal runoff uh, is, yeah, is yeah, key record. and important here. Can we go record? Can I just make a comment regarding, yes, yes. regarding going slow with these atherectomy devices? You know, uh, a lot of times when when uh, when you first come out of training, uh, one thing you you kind of get nervous with some of these devices. They make these noises, the grinding noises, what have you. And uh, the place where you get in trouble is when you start pushing these things forward because you either get nervous or you want to get the case done too quick. All of these devices, you have to let them engage that, that uh, lesion, and you have to let, let it do its work, especially uh, like an orbital atherectomy device, something like that. See the like limit we've gained? Forward, that's where you break off. We're about a two by two here. Getting embolization. Yeah, that's a great comment. The IVIS post laser, real quick. Ivy, can you point up here on the screen? So this shows us that we prepped the vessel. We've got a, now about a two by two 
millimeter vessel at some points. And what's interesting is you'll see the vessel open up at times in stent. Um, remember, this was a deflecting tip uh, that we were using. Um, at some places you get a little bit larger lumen, some it's about the same. But I think we've modified this plaque. You can see as we're going through, um, there's there's divots or there's breaks in this uh, this restenotic plaque um, from the deflecting tip. Um, you see how it gets larger in certain areas? It's in, that's probably from the hibernating vessel um, and there was more soft plaque in that region. All right, then what we did is um, put a speckle in geography. Um, and then what we did, let me just show you this real quick. Um, we then used the jade balloon. Um, and the nice thing about the jade, this is a 50240 jade. Um, and what we did was, is this jade is made by Orbis Nations, really the only non-compliant balloon on the peripheral market except for Kevlar. And so this is a 50240 jade. As you can see here, we took it down to the pop. I think it's undersized distally. And then we pulled it back um, proximally. The other thing nice about this, and let me just show you to run this for you. Look how fast this balloon deflates. Um, it's a 240 balloon, and it deflates in less than 10 seconds. So it's pretty impressive. Um, after doing this, then we uh, balloon proximally, and then um, we took a picture. Let's see here. Here it comes. And we've got a nice lumen now. So a little bit of a constriction proximally. And then as we come distally, again, very nice, very nice lumen. Then what we've done is we've gone in with a Stellar X. And this is a 6 by 200 Stellar X. Um, we've left it up for three minutes. And then we're going to get a 60150 Stellar X and the balloon proximally giving us biologic therapy, but hopefully uh, help prevent future restenosis. Any comments so far? So, George, uh, looks great so far. Excellent work. Uh, can you tell us, when you looked at your IVIS, how did you know you were done with laser at that point and you didn't need to do any other vessel prep or removal of tissue or debulking? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And this is atherectomy as a whole, I believe. If the goal of atherectomy is to prep the vessel, okay, uh, depending on what type of plaque morphology you're dealing with, on the soft end of the plaque spectrum, so homogeneous and restenotic plaque, because sometimes in these occlusions you get a soft inner core, the fear is, is that you could throw a lot of this distally, and especially in this woman who is three vessel raw, the last thing you want to do is trash the outflow. So what I think of when you look at the IVIS post, you are actually able to get a two by two or a two by three inner lumen, which hopefully takes care of that homogeneous plaque. Um, the other thing that you would see, if I'd have gone a little bit slower, you can see this flowering. Um, and this is from that deflecting tip. So you actually are causing breaks in this restenotic plaque, or at least that's the way I think about it, such that when you go in with balloon angioplasty, it'll help stretch that restenotic plaque, that fibrous type of tissue. So um, in lieu of what I saw on Ivis, I thought we had done enough. Um, granted, with this long lesion and understanding this restenotic and the nature of that inner core, I still put down a filter. So. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. And I, I think the important thing here is for everybody to realize angiogram, cross, filter, because you know you got thrombus there, and then debulking, and then therapy, whatever you decide. Yeah. Uh, any comments from the panelists here? Uh, I just have a, a, huh? a question. We have Dr. Singh. Uh, George is going to give us a um, uh, So uh, with atherectomy, are you more concerned about luminal gain, initial luminal gain, or about plaque modification? So did you hear that, George? Um, a plaque, yeah, a plaque modification with any atherectomy, um, not only with homogeneous plaque, but also with calcific plaque. Remember that um, a lot of these calcific plaques on the other end of the spectrum, you'll see these breaks in the plaque. And the way I think about it is sort of like your driveway, right? So with the seams in your driveway, the reason you have seams is such that when it gets hot or cold, your, dry, your concrete can expand or constrict without you getting these breaks or these cracks in your driveway. 
what I'm trying to prevent here is these long spiral dissections, okay, as well as um, throwing stuff distally. Um, and hopefully, with the hopefully it he also helps with recall, and then also helps with us getting biologic therapies to the adventitia of the vessel, such that we can prevent this smooth muscle cell proliferation. So in answer to your question, modification of the practice, what I'm trying to obtain, it's not size of the lumen. Dr. Shemias, you know, you, you spoke about this already, but what are your thoughts on what are you trying to achieve with atherectomy in the case of ISR? What are you looking for? Yeah, so, so this is a great question, and, and I don't know if we have a very good answer for but let me tell you what my take on this. You know, there are certain lesions where you really need to debulk, and debulk aggressively, not just lightly. Uh, I agree that we need to change a whole lot of the um, uh, vessel compliance, but in this situation, we have a stent. I don't think vessel compliance is an issue anymore. It's kind of eliminated by the presence of the stent. So here, it's mostly try to remove as much of the tissue as you can without damaging that stent. It's probably important. However, we are very limited in our atherectomy devices and how much we can accomplish that. Yep. If you think about the rotational devices, you know, whether the jet stream, uh, or others, you know, they are only limited yeah. to the tip of the catheter size, you know, and if you're looking at a six, seven millimeter, and I noticed this vessel starts at seven millimeter tapered down all to about four or five, just looking at the IVIS. So you have a differential sizing in this. You are going to be limited in the proximal and mid segment of how much you're going to be debulking. So that, that's going to be a limitation. The directional cutters, unfortunately, you know, the, the um, Hawk device is essentially a contraindication in the U.S. for the use in ISR. Uh, but you could uh, technically use the pantheris device if you want to debulk more, you know, while you're visualizing at the same time the stent. Uh, but again, most of us have the laser, they have the jet stream available at this point, and we will be limited to how much we can debulk with those. Yeah, that's a great point. So I think the key here to realize is also that uh, you don't, you, this is not a lesion you want to use directional atherectomy, right? This is a long segment ISR case. You can try, but I think that's just going to make it very complex, much more cumbersome, more chance for bad things to happen. So, George, what's the plan now? Now that you have uh, luminal, you have some luminal gain, vessel prep, plaque modification, yep. etc. It looks good. What's the plan? Yeah. yeah. So the nice thing is, is I typically leave my drug coated balloons up for three minutes. I know the Europeans tell me I only need two, but I typically leave them up for three. For two reasons. Number one, I think that you probably get a little bit more drug to the adventitia. But what also sways my thinking is what the below the knee drug coated balloon study showed us. And what I mean that by that is optimal uh, balloon dilatation. So what was interesting with a lot of these studies are the newer studies with the longer balloon inflation, the control arm sometimes does just as good as the drug coated balloon arm. And I believe the reason why is, is Twofold. Number one is they have a stepwise approach to increasing pressure, and number two is the length of time that you leave pressure on uh, on the actual lesion. So I'm leaving it up for three minutes. The other person, just to mention this, there was a there was an engineer by the name of Mullen, and he worked on rubber. And he and similarly, he showed us that to break the bonds of rubber, you needed two things: light, so the stepwise approach in terms of the increase in pressure, and then the length of time that you held that pressure on that rubber, it broke the bond so it would stretch rather than crack or break. So saying that, I'm going to use two drug-coated balloons like I've shown you, and then we're going to take a picture, and my hope is, is that it's going to look really good and we don't have to place any more, more scaffold. Hey, George, could I ask you a question? Steve Jenkins from Oshner here, and to Nick Shemias. Yes, and so the question is, since we're having such a discussion about uh, about reducing our plaque volume, et cetera, uh, changing the compliance of this. And I won't tell anybody I've ever done this as I have, and I know it's off-label use of the device. But if you're looking for a device to, and you know where I'm going, <laughs> if you're looking for a device to debulk the tissue inside stents, um, why would you not use orbital atherectomy, which is an off-label use of that device? But do you think there's advantages to that and could... You and uh, Shemai's comment on that. Yeah. So, so the, the concern here, and I think Renew Vermani has shown this very eloquently, at least in this case, with instant restenotic plaque or those, or those chronic total occlusions, there's an inner core of soft, uh, soft plaque. And what Orbital does is that um, it would throw a lot, of, a lot of this soft plaque distally. 
And that's in, I would be um, afraid that I may uh, trash the outflow. So that's the reason I wouldn't use it here. The other thing is, is with orbital, with normal tissue, remember it flexes away from the crown typically. So you need a harder type of plaque, that calcium, or that heterogeneous plaque that has those calcific speckles in order to break that calcium. So in this case, I probably wouldn't use orbital just for, just for those reasons. But Nick, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I agree with you 100%. You know, I, the biggest concern for me is is a lot of friable tissue and a lot of uh, soft, uh, you know, uh, you know, probably thrombotic tissue more than anything else. And what you're going there is just really whip yeah. it, uh, you know, and, and mix it all together with the orbital device. And, and you can potentially end up embolizing massively, you know, in these cases. That's my biggest concern. Now, if you don't have a CTO, uh, you know, in an ISR, maybe you can get away uh, by using it without too much embolization. Uh, but in a CTO, like you've seen it, it's just all, uh, most of it is just a mixed thrombotic disease. So I try to avoid that as much as I can. Uh, the other thing is, you're right. I mean, I don't know how much really debulking we can accomplish, you know, with the rotational uh, or, or orbital atherectomy, I, I think it's probably not going to be as effective as when you have calcified tissue. Uh, we know the deflection from the softer tissue does happen, uh, but I do know that it does debulk. You know, we've done that before. You know, and it does debulk, but to the to what extent, it's really very unclear at this point. Yeah, it's great, all great points. I think we're going to go to the next talk, George, if that's okay while you're uh, in limbo there. That sounds perfect. Okay. And, and let me, can I make one comment real sure, quick sure. before we move on? The, the, I think one of the most important things, and I just want to interject here, I've got a tech working behind me. If you do enough cases with your team, they can do it without you, which makes me a little bit scared. So she's already done everything while I'm over here talking. So y'all keep y'all keep talking, and I'll, and I'll visit with you all in a minute. Okay, that's great. And for those that don't use orbital atherectomy, remember there's two <laughs> mechanisms, right? right? One is the, sh the sanding or the shaving of, really hard tissue, hard plaque calcification. Right, and the second one is the pulsatile forces to try to disrupt the medial calcification that you get as a result. Any compliant tissue is just gonna move away and that's why it doesn't work with ISR, not to mention our thrombus that's there that'll probably go distally. What we got, um, so this was after um, the drug coated balloon, the 60150 um, proximally. And it looks pretty good. So there's a little bit of recoil proximally right at the uh, deep thermal takeoff um, and some a little bit of recoil in the mid-segment. But what's interesting is as we get down here to the pop where the filter is, there's slow flow. So let me give you a, a magda view of what that looks like. And that's, uh, you can see the filter and there's slow flow right above the tibial vessel. So I'm, I'm glad we put the uh, embolic protection down. Absolutely. Now the question is, what do you do? Because filter looks pretty full. So what we did next is we took a uh, penumbra, a cat six, and went down and just um, tried to clean the proximal portion of that filter. Okay? And, and what I did was is I pulled my 019 bare wire back. Um, so show them right here on the screen. I put, pulled that 019 bare wire back to the filter so I wouldn't push my filter into this um to the tibial vessel. And then I was able to suck it out. And then I was able to remove it. Um, let's see here. Is it going? There it goes. All right, and you can see it. Close is pretty good. I capture it. And then what I did was always whenever I fill a basket up like this, I watch it as I pull it through the stent just to make sure there's no, no issues, right? And then, so then after we did that, this was our result. Um, again, we got some recoil uh, in that mid-segment and then distally, okay? And then we got good, good runoff. Look here, look at that pop in those tibials. Now, I, now I'm a perfectionist. So then what I did was, because of that recoil, took a 6-0 jade balloon in. Um, and this is what we got. Um, we took a 60240J and I ballooned it. Now you've got a larger lumen, probably about 20% residual proximally. Very nice vessel through it. The only concern piece you see distal to the stent. I'm trying to look find failure points. Why did this lady re, re And I would imagine it's probably from the distal and the proximal 
um, ends of these stents. So I'm going to go in with a short Stellar X of 5060 and just hit this distal segment, and then I think I think we're going to be all done. So and a great case, a lot of teaching points. Um, so uh, any comments from the panel? Yeah. I'm sorry, George. Well, I, I missed you there. I lost you. I said, any comments? Um, a lot of teaching points with this. Yeah, I, I have uh, one question. Do you put the filter again after you dilated it, after you removed your first filter? And let me tell you why, George. Deep emboli have shown that you still have about 20% embolization post atherectomy after you dilate that one more time with no filter. In fact, as if you remember with the deep emboli trial, you know, we had two filters, one pre-atherectomy and one post-balloon dilation following atherectomy. And in both cases, we had significant amount of embolization. A lot of that tissue, as you know, is still that, that debris is still in the vessel wall, many of it. You know, we, did, we didn't debulk at 100%. So we tend to, if we absolutely have to post-dilate, we tend to put another filter in. I don't know. What do you think? Well, when you're the, starting out on And this, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, yeah, great point. So when you're beginning uh, as young people, fellows, et cetera, um, if you don't use filters, eventually you will use them 100% of the time. So I have a question. Could somebody give me a reason not to use a filter when doing SFA intervention, period? Anybody on the panel? Just the George? cost, I guess. <laughs> For what? The cost, you mentioned. For the uh, cost. That's a great point. Well, the, uh, cost the cost is increased number. when you have to go chase all of this debris distally. It's well, much more cost. Was that the cost you were mentioning? And George, a uh, question for you. So at this point, you obviously don't have a filtered a distal protection device. You're going to do, uh, looks like Stellar X DCB for those focal areas. Would you put in a short covered stent? What is your thought process here? Would anybody on the panel? Then you don't have to worry about this yeah, protection, right? Because you're covering it completely. What are your guys' thoughts? I'm trying to be a little controversial. Yeah, no, 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 no. A absolutely. And I appreciate the comment. I wouldn't put a covered stint in distally. And the reason why is I just want to leave all my options open for my vascular surgery colleagues because I would imagine in the future she may need a bypass. And, you know, the way I've approached her, remember, she's 57 years old and I've gotten her through this long. It's sort of like, person for me, for someone that has coronary artery disease at an early age, if I, I eventually know that they're probably going to need bypass in the future. So if I can throw long that time so I can get them a, a little bit older, then I think it just leaves their options open. So if I can prefer not to place one, if I can, just to leave that option open. So I, I kind of yeah. agree with him. I'm not sure I would uh, land another stent. So you might not lose that, that option, but the problem is once you land that stent, you don't know what kind of result you're going to have. You might have to put another stent. Now you're basically going further and further down. So I think it's reasonable to, to put another balloon up, a DCB, but uh, I would probably put a filter up first.